Well, it is a pleasure, a real pleasure to be here today because my work is all about education. My job, which I received no compensation. In fact, when I retired, I promised my wife I would never work for money again. She actually thought I said, I will never work again. So uh, this, to me, is the best work I could ever do, and that is an opportunity to stand in front of a group of interested, willing students and maybe show you some steps that you can take, ways to do better with the money you've worked so hard to accumulate. Now today, Tom asked me to speak about the, the habits and the attitudes of successful investors. Now, the good news is that probably most of you are doing over 90% of what you need to do to get all that you're likely to get as an investor. And between this presentation and some more today, my hope is, is that I can show you some ways to do a little bit more. In thinking about this, this topic, the habits and attitudes, I thought back about, uh, about the time when I came into the business in 1966, and I reflected on what kinds of habits and attitudes did people have back then. And it's interesting how different it was, totally different. First of all, the top tax rate was 70%. The top marginal tax rate, if you made 200,000 more, or more, you got taxed 70%. And I think back to that time, and I rarely heard, heard anybody complain about paying 70%. I mean, that's unbelievable, isn't it? And the corporate rate was higher, and I think the long-term capital gains rate was about 28% at that point. And people knew so little about investing. And they paid so much to participate in the process. Back then, a mutual fund charged an 8.5% load. And nobody ever said, what does that 8.5% cost me over a lifetime? Because it was simply accepted that was the price that you paid to invest. And when the first money markets came out to the public, they literally tried to put an 8.5% load on money market funds. And people rebelled. And they quickly changed. They were just glad to keep your money in their brokerage house or their mutual fund family. And when we transacted, bought 100 shares or 1,000 shares of IBM or some individual stock, you paid anywhere from five to a hundred times more to make that purchase or that sale. And we accepted it because commissions were regulated. And the times have they changed. Have they changed? Also, it was considered back then that if you held 10 to 20 stocks, that was adequate diversification. Now think about that compared to what you hear today. There was no Money Magazine. There was no Wall Street Week. There was a little printed on thin paper thing called the Kiplinger Report. And I suspect some of you took that in your early years of investing. There was no Jim, well maybe Jim Cramer was around, but he wasn't on TV. So th those things changed in terms of how people looked and they thought about investing. We didn't know about value versus growth and, and, and small cap versus large. We didn't have any of the academic research that's come along since that time. And so what we knew were there were things called aggressive growth funds, capital appreciation funds, these were funds you could make some real money in, and the industry, as they have always done, highlighted those funds that were making the most money, thinking that you would buy the fact that since something has been doing well lately, it will continue to do well. 
Uh, we still may suffer from that a little bit today, right? It's human nature. But it was a different world. It was a, a, a world of high costs, of low, relatively low diversification, and most successful investors, it was really about being a great saver. A great saver. And at the end of the day, when we talk about great savers, we're also talking about great spenders. But that doesn't mean you spend a lot. If you're a great spender, you spend a little and still survive and enjoy life. Mostly those are called engineers. <laughs> That's my experience anecdotally. And they rarely marry an engineer, which causes immediate problems. You know. <laughs> but high savings rate, being aggressive, Investing was about being aggressive and making money, and a lot of people did. Now, today, it's still about frugality. That hasn't changed. And people think, oh, I can't possibly save any money. I've got all this college debt, et cetera. And yes, there's a lot of that today that we didn't have when we came out of college. But I talk to young people all the time who are saving 10 and 15 and 20 percent, and they do it by giving up other things they could have. One of my dearest friends, who's a couple of years, three years older than I, they saved his wife's income. They bought used cars, including a used Volkswagen. They took vacations that normally amounted to camping. They lived in modest homes. He had a job that paid a relatively high salary, but they never lived that way. And at 48, he retired. And now lives in San Miguel de Allende, my favorite second city. And I've written about that at marketwatch.com. I have an article there about San Miguel. How many have been to San Miguel out of curiosity? A few. It's a great place. So what do we, what do we know now? We know that way back when we had pensions and, and, and most co large corporations had pensions. What do we know now? Not very many do. So we're kind of on our own and there's never been a time that education is, it was more important than it is right now in terms of how this whole process of investing works. And the good news is, there is so much great information about how to be a successful investor. There's almost no excuse for not getting it right. People have come by my table out there and asked whether this book is enough. Is it, does it have what it needs? Well, there are lots of great books on investing. And dozens of them have virtually everything, that almost everything you need. It's just to have the willingness to accept the fact that this is not all that complex. I teach high school kids how to be a successful investor. They get it if you make it simple, if you make it one choice at a time. And I want to talk about a few choices right now that we've all made either by design or by default. But each one of these leads down another, a different path. I've got a free ebook. I've got three free ebooks on my website. One of them is 101 Investment Decisions Guaranteed, Guaranteed to Change Your Financial Future. I can't guarantee whether it'll be better or worse, but I can guarantee it'll be different, okay? <laughs> But I looked at 101 forks in the road and thought in terms of best practices at each fork in the road. And if you take this whole process one step, one choice at a time, load versus no load. High school kids, when you explain the difference, they make the right choice. And here's why these choices have become so important. What has changed since 1966, when I came into this industry, 
What has changed in a big, big way is back then people thought of investing to be a success, you had to be aggressive. It was about offense, not defense. But if you look at how the academics have taught us about how to be a good to great investor, it's about defense. I've got a list of them in the handout. You all have handouts at your table. And think about each one of these. One company in your portfolio versus thousands. Well, what does that diversification do but create defense, right? Because one company is not defensive. I don't care how good it is. One industry versus many. One asset class versus many. One country versus many. Every time you get the word many, you've got another level of defense. And of course, the trick is, as best you can, to figure out how to do the many upon many upon many and still give you a good return. And it turns out it's not that difficult. It's not that difficult but because it turns out that most of the money that you make in your portfolio is going to be determined by what asset class you're in. And once you know what that asset class in is, you want as many stocks and companies in that asset class as you can get. Which always sounds to a group of people like, if you do all that diversification at all these different levels, I'm not going to get any return. You're going to diversify my return away. That's not the way it works. And each one of these, the, these additional levels of diversification are creating a way to manage risk. And risk is about losing. Humans hate to lose. We hate to lose so much that when the market goes down 5 or 10%, we kind of panic, even though somebody told us that from time to time it's going to go down 50%, our body goes into kind of a, of a, you lose your breath because you're afraid it's going to go on and on and on. There's no evidence that that happens, unless you have Enron, <laughs> Eastern Airlines, WAMU. That's a long list, by the way, which is why anybody in their right mind who's telling you what to do for their own safety as well as yours is going to recommend broad diversification. But there's another way to manage risk, and that is to actually manage those risks that would just suck the life out of your portfolio. I mean that. Suck the life out of your portfolio. Those 8.5% loads that they charged way back in the 60s, or the 5 or 6% they charge now, it's sucking out maybe a half of 1% a year for the rest of your life. That's the real impact of paying that, that load. Even 5%, it's going to take out about a half a percent per year. And most of us don't realize that if we, if we save $5,000 a year for 40 years, and that's what I'm talking to these kids at Western about, is doing that for an extended period of time, and you make 8% versus 8.5%, and you get to retirement, and you start taking money out of your portfolio, and you add up the money you took out with the money that's left over for your heirs, you end up with about $2 million more at 8.5% than 8. It's huge. If you give young people the, the, the choice between low taxes or high taxes, well, we all know what they should pick. And yet so often in our portfolios are investments that in fact have high tax implications, have high turnover implications, have ways that are costing us and our heirs money. And once we focus on those, uh, this is what, what Warren Buffett said, to be a success, you only have to do very few things right. As long as you don't do too many things wrong. And he's right. I really believe that there's just a handful of things we need to focus on. 
I think we have to make the decision whether we're going to trust somebody who's going to be our advisor who has a fiduciary responsibility or what they call suitability responsibility. And it's a world of difference. And I, can, I, I can't say I guarantee, but I'll tell you, I feel very strongly people who go with people who have a suitability responsibility in terms of giving advice are literally going to end up with half as much money in their retirement and to leave their family as they could have had they done business with somebody who had a fiduciary responsibility. And if you really don't know what that's about, it's worth a couple of minutes to read about it on the internet. So there are these decisions, and every one of them seems, in my mind, to be defensive. So now we're talking about to be a successful investor. Yes, you have to put some portion of your portfolio at risk, but we can do that and in most cases achieve our needs for return. I suspect most people in this room, if we got a hold of you early enough in your investing career, would have been able to do just fine with market rates of return. You didn't have to beat the market that Wall Street wanted to suggest that you could do if you would just follow them into battle. Just market rates of return. And of course, I think what you've probably heard about here today is there are different markets. There are markets that are lower risk, that are built to be less profitable, and there are, there are asset classes that are built to be more profitable. And kind of the magic is how you put them together to meet whatever your need for return is and what your risk tolerance is. And one of the interesting things about the, the kind of the attitude of investors today is not like it used to be. If I, if I asked, let me, let me give you three choices. You have to choose one of these as your primary objective as an investor. One is, I want to beat the market. Number two is, I want to get the highest return I can within my risk tolerance. Three is, I want to find the lowest risk rate to achieve the need that, of return that I need. How many would say that their primary objective is to beat the market? Okay, a few. Which means, by the way, if the market's down 40 and you're down 30, way to go. <laughs> you did it. How many would say your goal is to get the highest rate of return you can within your risk tolerance? Yeah. I'm not surprised that, that many of you would say that. And the beauty is, in terms of simplicity, it's not just that investing is easy for you. In a way, it's easy for those of us who have been involved in the investment advisory business, because if you tell me you want to get the highest return you can within your risk tolerance, all I have to do is determine what your risk tolerance is. Unfortunately, it's a moving target. And in good markets, you have higher risk tolerance, and in bad markets, you have lower risk tolerance, and you drive us nuts. <laughs> but that's the job of a good advisor, is to help kind of bring people back to the table and understand what these trade-offs of risk and return are about. How many want to find the lowest risk way to achieve the rate of return you need for the rest of your life? Ah, isn't that a good feeling to think you could do that? Well, I believe you can, and I believe that is a matter then of just looking at numbers. What else do we have but to look at the past? People criticize me because I keep looking at the past, going all the way back to 1928 in many cases, to see what the market has done under different conditions. And they say, hey, what does that have to do with today? Well. I mean, Nixon is never going to be president again. So we know that that isn't necessarily about today. But what we do know is the market goes up and the market goes down, and it goes down 50% uh, some of the time. In fact, every th four to five years, it goes down 30%. The market, the S&P 500, on average, 30%. So if you've got all your money in the S&P 500, on average, every three to four, four to five years, you're going to lose 30%. You can be Pollyannish and say, no, that's not going to be like that in the future. Successful investors today understand that luck is a big part of the outcome. Luck 
uh, in your handout material, bottom of the second page, I have a few numbers that about the past. How would you like to have return, re, started investing in 1975 and you kept plowing your money into the equity markets from 75 until 99? It turns out the compound rate of return for the S&P 500 was 17.2%. How lucky was that? That's hugely lucky. But you happen to be there, and there are many people in this room who actually invested over all of those years. And there were times it was real scary, like the day the market fell 22% in one day. And people thought it was the start of a depression. I was in the business then, and people were calling to find out if their money market funds were likely to be okay. It was a panic. And it turned out as so often that it came back and the system continued to work. Filled with crooks then, filled with crooks today. Do not think that the people are any more honest today than they were then. But from 2000 to 2015, the S&P 500 compounds at 4.1. And people think this is a new era. We cannot depend on higher returns in the future. This is the way it's going to be. Well, that is the way it was from 28 to 39. It was a 2.8% a year compound rate of return. From 1960 uh, uh, through 74, it was 4.3% 4, 3, 4 compound rate of return. And then also on this page I have included small cap value for you. I happen to believe, and this afternoon I'll talk about how to turn $3,000 into $50 million for a kid or a grandkid, but I happen to believe that all of us should have some, at least a little piece of small cap value in your portfolio, and you can see over those same periods the premium that small cap has added. And who told us about it? Did Wall Street teach us about small cap? Did Wall Street teach us about indexing? Did Wall Street teach us about value and the, and the impact of adding value to your portfolio? No. That all came out of the academic community. And when I start, first started preaching the idea that the academics knew a better way of investing than Wall Street, and people say, oh, yeah, 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 we know about academics. They don't know about doing stuff. They only know about talking about it. Well, it just turns out from everything I can find, they are the best source in the industry for advice. And I think that's pretty well established now. And I take it to a whole other level in terms of what I expect out of the people who served me. And every one of you, I think, should, should consider this anytime you expect to follow somebody in how they suggest you invest, whether it's a, an article that somebody writes or a book that somebody writes or an advisor you go to or your neighbor who you think knows more about investing than you do and may not even be telling you the truth. They only tell you about the good trades. And maybe the things they're investing in that they're telling you about, they've got 1% of their portfolio in that. We don't know about the real story behind these kinds of bragging that, that happens to attract us. I believe that when we hire an advisor, the two things we want, other than that they're nice people, but folks, everybody's nice in this business. If they're not, they don't last. But are they competent and are they ethical? That's all I want to know. Of course, you have to know how to determine if they are competent and ethical. But it seems to me, if they're recommending mutual funds with high expenses, with a load, with high turnover, and all these things that are sucking money out of our portfolios, I'm questioning either the intelligence, competence, or the ethics. 
And here's one of the problems. Those investments with the highest commissions, they are the hardest to sell. That's why they offer a very high commission to the salesperson, because people are smarter, and but the salesperson has to overcome every objection that you have or find somebody who's brainless about this topic. Ethics and competence. But it's not enough to have an advisor that's ethical and competent. Almost everybody will say that about their stockbroker. Uh, yes, he's working for me, and he knows a lot. Well, he knows more than I do, you'd say. But what about the firm that he or she works for? Are they ethical and competent? If they're not, do you want to do business with an advisor who works for a boss that is not ethical and competent? Does that make any sense? And yet it happens every time. People focus on the person who uh, go to church with them. But maybe they're working for the devil. We don't know, oftentimes. I think it's as important to know about the competence and the ethics of the firm that the advisor works for as the advisor themselves, because they are the boss. They're the ones who tell the advisor, here's what we believe, here's what needs to be sold. And if you think it's hard to determine the competence and ethics of Wall Street firms, I just ask you to do this. Go to your favorite search engine, put in the name of a popular brokerage house, and put the word fraud after it. Or you can put the word churning after it. Or misrepresentation after it or Ponzi scheme after it. And get ready for a long night's reading. Because, I mean, sometimes if you look at the number of results that you get, it's millions. And if, you, if the firm, if the boss is paying a $100 million fine here and a $10 million fine there and $500 million fine here, for which they rarely ever take responsibility unless the courts require them to, so they're never really guilty. They just wanted to get that lawsuit off the books. I wouldn't do business personally with somebody who paid that much money in fines and fines and, and, and did so many dastardly things to people's life savings. Don and Tom talk about real money. And the real money I think they're talking about is your money. And so it's the most important money that you know, right? And so it, you have to go one step deeper, I think. And you have to look at the products that the advisor and the firm recommend. And if they are not ethical and competent, this is really a bad relationship because it's going to end in the probability. All we're talking about is probabilities. Probabilities. Because we can never say guarantee, really. We, we never have proof how this works, this whole process about stocks and bonds and big and small and all that. We do not have proof. We have evidence. Evidence cannot be called proof, or can it be a guarantee? Another thing about successful investors is that they have learned how to ignore the noise, the predictions, the feeling of panic when things appear to be unwinding. Yes, of course you know there's always list A, the good news, and list B, the bad news. They're always there. So if I want to be interviewed and quoted in a publication, and the, and, and the writer of the article is asking, well, wh what do you think's going on, Paul? What's, what's, what do you think the market? Why is it going down? Well, I'll give them five reasons the market's going down. Of course, if the market were going up that particular day or week, I could give them five reasons it's going up, because both lists exist at all times. And if I don't give them something that makes sense, they think I'm crazy. 
So if the reason the market is going down is because of a lot of good news, doesn't that sound crazy? So if you want to get quoted, you give them what will get you quoted. Some presidential candidates have figured that out. <laughs> but here's what we know. This is a way bigger problem than we understand. I would guess that the returns that people in this room have received over the long term have been okay. I don't know that they've been great, but they've been okay. But the Dalbar Company has actually studied the returns of all the U.S. equity mutual funds. And they look at them in for 10 and 20 and 30 year periods. The last 30 years and in 2014, the 15 numbers haven't come out yet, the compound rate of return of the S&P 500 was 11.1%. Uh, and the compound rate of return of the average investor, actual return that they got, that compound rate of return was 3.8. How can it be that the market made 11 and the investors made less than four. I think it is a combination of getting bad advice. It is also a combination, uh, also impacted by paying high expenses. And it's impacted when you panic and you sell out. And then you get back in later when it's comfortable. We all know intuitively that investors tend to sell when markets are low. They tend to buy when markets are high. And what happens is then, if you actually follow that cash through the mutual fund industry and pretend that each mutual fund represented one investor, and that investor's cash flow in and cash flow out, you can see how the average investor did in that in that fund. It's a catastrophic result because it's not much more than inflation. And in bonds, it's the same thing. The return, and this is really strange because uh, and maybe it's not as strange as, as, as it seems, but the difference is about one-tenth. They got about 0.7 percent dollar average versus about seven if you were in the Barclays uh, aggregate index. And what happened? Well, did a lot of those people put their money in money market funds? Why were people rushing to money market funds? They were rushing to money market funds because they were afraid interest rates were going to go up and their bonds were going to go down. And that line has been on the street for about six years. And so while you responded to the experts, I mean, this is the reality. We hear somebody make a statement often enough. There's one right now on the internet. Stock market's going down 80%. Anybody seen that ad? It's everywhere if you're looking at financial websites. Well, you can start to believe that. Again, as we know from politicians, if they keep saying it time after time after time, to a lot of people it becomes in their mind a fact. So what is it that we can do? What is it that we can do to become better investors? Well, number one, obviously, to get an education. Number two, understand that nobody can make you money in the market. Nobody. I have never made an investor a penny, ever. The market made it. We don't make it. The job of an advisor is to find out who you are. Does the, all of this stuff about how to invest successfully that, that DFA, you know, they're, they're so smart about investing today that how to invest is not a secret. It's how to get you to invest and stay invested. 
make sure that you have the right enough exposure to risk in order to meet your needs, to, to, to achieve your long-term objectives. You are the problem in terms of understanding. And if you are not honest with an advisor and tell them everything, they can't do their best work. It always was interesting to me when I was in the business how people you'd meet with them, and as Tom mentioned, it didn't matter if anybody had any money. I would sit down and look at their situation and tell them what I would do. Um, but so often, after you earn their trust, it turns out they got a whole bunch more money than you knew. <laughs> and all that time that you thought was just being a good guy and a, doing a good deed turned out to actually be a good deal. But for the for the client as well as the advisor. But that honesty is important, and I really think that it should be requirement that the oftentimes disinterested or uninterested spouse, and they are not disinterested or uninterested, I guarantee you, that they be part of the process. And that when you go to meet with an advisor, go there with questions and get the spouse to come up with his or her own questions. Get them involved. I am highly likely to die before my wife. She's almost 18. No. <laughs> that, that's, she'll love that, actually. But, but she must be ready. And for many people, like myself, I, I have an advisor. I don't do my own stuff. I got a life. I got work to do. I'm retired. <laughs> and that's true of, of most retirees. They're busy. So I don't want to worry about the money. But I think that even if you only do a part of your portfolio with an advisor that can get to know you and your spouse and your family, and work with them, knowing that someday that money is probably all, all the money will come over when you're no longer there if you're the interested party. Because you're going to be gone, so this will not be a concern for you, but one of the things I remember so vividly is how a surviving spouse felt without having that person that they relied on so much about these kind of matters not there. If you have a relationship with an advisor, I think it makes a huge difference. So, those are my ideas, and I write about them every week. Somebody today came over and said they listened to my podcast, and he said so honestly, sometimes you are so boring. <laughs> I like And, uh, and, and that's okay, because a lot of successful investing information is supposed to be boring. Boring is beautiful to me. I want numbers. I want you to have numbers. I want you to pin those numbers down. I want you to know how much you're willing to lose, because if you follow my advice, I can absolutely guarantee you will lose money. Absolutely guarantee it. Not forever. That wouldn't make any sense, would it? but for a period of time. And that's information I think you really, really need to know. So I do a podcast every week. You can go to paulmerriman.com, sign up for the podcast. I do an article every week, which is on Market Watch, or you can go to paulmerriman.com. I have three free ebooks. I mentioned one. Another one is First Time Investor Think, uh, uh, grow and protect your money. And the last one is get smart or get screwed. <laughs> How to select the best and get the most out of your financial advisor. I do workshops from time to time. And uh, my, own, my goal, my only goal, is to make each and every person a better investor.
I answer questions every day. I can't answer them all. I left three by five cards at your table that you can write a question on there, leave me the email address. I will not sign you up for the bi-weekly newsletter. You have to do that yourself. But I address 10 to 20, uh, monthly I address 20 to 40 Q&As because that's the help I'm trying to be. I have this feeling that there's somebody who is shadowing me on my left. <laughs> Has anybody noticed that? Oh, here he comes. This is a great friend, really, a great pal, and I'm so happy to be here. Thank you all very much. So, and